Right, great. So uh, welcome everybody to our uh, Kilimanjaro Q&A. Uh, my name is Rami and uh, I'm a team leader with Life Happens Outdoors. Uh, we've been doing Kilimanjaro for quite some time now and I've been to the summit of this mountain uh, more than 10 times. Uh, and every single time is just as spectacular as, as ever. Um, I just wanted to uh, just put, let you know how this is going to run really quickly. So uh, people are being let in and out, so don't worry about um, being able to stay all the way till the end if you can't. Uh, and if anybody is tuning in um, at, in the midway, that's okay as well. Uh, we, uh, we're going to just have a quick uh, introduction about uh, Kilimanjaro. I've got a couple of slides I want to show you, and particularly the, the Machami route, which is the route that we at Life Happens Outdoors prefer to take. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about why that is as well. And, uh, and, but if you have any questions as we're going through it all, please feel free to just drop them in the uh, chat. So you can just click on chat and you can type uh, your questions over. We're gonna collect them and then we'll just address them uh, at the end. Uh, it's just going to be a really short presentation in the beginning because I really do want to get to your questions. So, uh, so uh, do keep them coming as you think of them. And as soon as we get to the end, it'll be a, a pleasure for me to go through them uh, and, and get back to you on all of them. And what I'll do is I'll read out the questions so that you guys can all hear it rather than having audio come in and out. And that can be a little bit messy. Uh, also, before I get started, uh, I also want to let you guys know that for everybody who is attending today, uh, we've got a special voucher that we're going to be giving out to you. It's a promo code worth 200 euros uh, to book on a Kilimanjaro trip with us in 2021. So uh, do stay to the end uh, so that we hand that out to you uh, if you can. But if you can't stay to the end, we've taken note of everybody who's come in. So we will be sending that out to you by email. All right, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Kilimanjaro to you all. And hopefully technology will not fail me as I'm just about to share my screen. And hopefully, uh, hopefully you should all be able to see uh, that. Uh, this lovely lady with red hair who was perfectly posing for me on one of our trips to Kilimanjaro. I actually don't know. I, I, she wasn't actually with us. Uh, I saw her sitting there. I'm like, God, I got to snap this picture because it's so awesome. So uh, a really quick uh, intro about Kilimanjaro. So Kilimanjaro is a uh, volcano. Uh, it's actually made up of uh, three volcanoes. Uh, there, it's uh, Kibu, Mwenzi, and, uh, and Shira. Kibu is the highest of the three volcanoes and it's the one where that we trek to. So that's the summit. When people say that they've gone to the summit of Kilimanjaro, what they actually mean is they've gone to the summit of Kibu, which is the highest of the three volcanoes that make up the Kilimanjaro uh, uh, volcanic area. Uh, the mountain is 5,895 meters high. So it's pretty high up. It's of course the highest mountain in Africa and the, uh, uh, and, and the highest freestanding mountain on earth. Um, here's a little map uh, that we've kind of put together for you guys and it gives you an idea of the of the Machami route and I'm going to go through uh, kind of day by day how it goes but it's just to give you a broad idea of of the route of the mountain. So um, what we what we uh, tend to do is we like to go from uh, from the Machami gate and that's on the south uh, southwest side of the mountain we trek along the, the southern base of the mountain, and finally we summit from the east side, uh, which is up the other side of the mountain, uh, before making our way uh, all the way back down to Mueka Gate, which you can see all the way down in the corner of your screens there. So this is kind of the idea of the trek. Most people think that you know you were trekking in one direction straight up to the summit, and then we're coming straight back down. That's not how it is. Um, the, the trail actually goes across different environments. Um, it's, it's actually quite gradual. Uh, and we do it this way because it helps with acclimatization, which is our body getting used to being up in the high altitude. Kilimanjaro could be trekked in three days uh, or four days by some of us, but it doesn't give our bodies enough time to actually uh, get used to being at this altitude, which is why uh, we actually take a route that looks like this. And it's also the most, in my opinion, it's the most scenic route. 
because we get the sunset every day, which is, whereas if we were coming up the other side of the mountain, uh, we also, we benefit from the sunrise, but it's not as spectacular, especially if we're getting up early in the morning and, you know, we're, we're kind of doing stuff as that's happening. So I, I think this is actually probably the most scenic uh, route on the mountain. And I've done, I've gone, I've been up to the summit from, from every side. Uh, so just a quick one about how we run things. Uh, this is Kilimanjaro down from, uh, from the uh, Arusha National Park. Uh, so day one for us is actually, uh, or day zero, if you like, is where we pick you up from the airport. So when we're doing things with Kilimanjaro, it's all about, uh, we, we it's, everything is covered. So uh, uh, if it's me, most likely it will be me. Uh, I would personally pick you up from the airport um, and transport you to Moshi. Uh, which is our t which is the town uh, that we spend our our uh, our first evening in. The first day is all about just getting everybody from the airport because uh, people come in at different times. We have a team briefing together, and that's where we all get to know each other and uh, and have uh, our first dinner together. I also do a gear check, so go through everything with everybody to make sure that everybody has everything. Um, and if you don't, uh, not to worry because it's possible to, to, to make up for it uh, the following day. But we just make sure that you have everything the day before so that if there's anything we need to get, um, we can do that early in the morning. So uh, day one on the trail, we head to Machambi Gate and the first day is actually in the rainforest. So you can see there's like a little yellow out arrow uh, down in the corner. Uh, that's pretty much what we cover in the first day. Uh, in terms of horizontal distance, it's quite lengthy, but it's, but it's actually very gradual and it's actually a half day. So we start at around 12 midday because uh, we have to go through the check-in procedures at the gate. Kilimanjaro is a very well-run national park, so there's procedures that have, to, that have to be followed for us to check in. Uh, once that's done, we usually have lunch and then we start walking. And we tend to get to Machami Camp around, uh, around 4 to 5 o'clock in the evening, depending on our pace. Uh, in the rainforest, it's gorgeous. So you, you'll see, uh, this is the best opportunity to see animals like marmots, like monkeys. Um, it's, it, we, we take it slow. We, you know, there are lots of flowers, lots of things to see. It really feels, it, it has this wonderful Jurassic Park feeling um, and kind of gives everybody this, it, it's the lungs of the mountain. So you really do uh, see something that is quite spectacular and very different from what we're going to see on subsequent days. At Kilimanjaro, we pass through quite a few different environments. So, and every day is extremely dramatic and extremely different. So day one is deep rainforest, but day two couldn't be further from it. And we'll get to that in a second. Um, before I jump into day two, uh, Machami camp is the highlight of it. Uh, sorry, the first day, which is to get to Machami camp. Um, the highlight is the rainforest, of course. But for me personally, it's getting to the camp, learning how to set up the camp, learning how to put everything together for the first, you know, we, we, the, set, the camp is of course set up for you, but kind of getting your bearings around, uh, you know, how uh, life at camp. So, um, you know, where we have dinner, how we, you know, use our hot water, um, how things, things are run. And that's really a, a, an exciting part of the day. Um, and it becomes autopilot later on as we start to go from, from day to day. Uh, so day two is going up to Shira, and actually we, you can see that in the first part you've got this dense green um, rainforest. Now we get up into what's called the short grass vegetation. So it starts to feel a little bit more alpine um, and a little bit more, uh, the, the, tree, the, the tree line starts to drop. And you start to actually be able to see things further than just your immediate surrounding. It's actually the first opportunity to actually see the mountain itself. And here's a nice picture actually just coming out of Machami Camp. You can start to see what the mountain actually looks like. Of course, looking at it from here, it looks like, whoa, you know, how am I going to go up there? But, um, but the route is actually very gradual and we don't go directly from, this, from what you're looking at. But this is kind of what the mountain looks like if I was looking at it from Machami Camp as the as the vegetation, vegetation starts to change and it starts to become less of a rainforest and more of this alpine environment. Um, day two is also a short day. It's, uh, it's one in which uh, we actually reach the next camp for a hot lunch at the camp. So uh, we leave early in the morning, usually around 8.30, and we hope to be at the camp around 1.30. Uh, so it's not a full day with a packed bunch, rather it's one where we have a hot lunch at the camp. And it's also a great opportunity for like photo ops uh, because we're right on the cloud line here. So 
uh, you've got this mix of clouds, but vegetation, and it's also, you can start to see the mountains. So you get a bit of an idea of what that looks like. And it's, for me, getting to Shira, Shira Camp is one of my favorites. It's, uh, the views from there are just amazing. Day three is the first actual full day of trekking. So, so it's, it's taken us three days on the trail, four days in total to actually do a full day of trekking. Um, and this day is actually designed, it's where we go to Lava Tower and then down to Barranco. And this day is actually designed for acclimatization. So we actually go up to 4,000, uh, 4,600 meters of altitude, which is, uh, which is quite high. Um, it, just to put it into perspective for those of us who are Eurocentric, uh, the Mont Blanc is, which is the highest mountain in the European Alps is 4,810. So this is only, you know, this is, this is only less than 300 meters below that summit. Um, in terms of altitude. And it's a day where we, it's designed to do a long walk. So we walk all the way to, uh, to, to Lava Tower that usually takes around four to five hours. Um, we have lunch there and then we walk down to Barranco Camp, which takes an additional two hours. Um, so it's between a six and a seven hour day usually. And it's where people tend to feel the mountain a little bit more because we are really getting into that high altitude environment and your body is starting to realize that things are a little bit different than what it's used to. And it's, but we do that on purpose. As you can see, the trail actually goes up to, you know, a little bit uh, uh, out of the way and then goes down to Barranco, which is at 3,700. Uh, there's a direct trail to just cross beneath it, but we feel that it's important for everybody to acclimatize. And this has become kind of part of the, the route of, uh, of the Machami. It's also the first day where we get to see the glaciers up close. So up until now, there's been a distance between us and the glacier. And we actually get into a portion of the Arctic desert. Not really, not too much of Arctic desert. As you can see, there's still some vegetation on the ground. But we, ac we actually get, uh, we get a, a kind of a little bit of a feel for it. And uh, you can see here, this is Lava Tower. And Lava Tower is really interesting. It's the tower on the right-hand side. It's actually this, it's a, just a big, um, remnant of when the volcano last erupted. It's basically lava that's formed into this rock and it's turned itself into this tower. Um, and that's where we have lunch. And Lava Tower is very unusual. I've personally never been there where it hasn't been cloudy, uh, which al always gives it this kind of eerie, uh, mystical feel. And you could see how close we are to the glaciers, but then we head back down uh, into the Alpine environment at 3,700 for the evening. Uh, day four is another short day. Uh, this one is where we, we go up the Barranco Wall, which is quite famous. People get afraid of this thing. It's like the Barranco Wall, the Barranco Wall. But actually, there's a trail that goes through the Barranco Wall. So great for photos, uh, not scary. A lot of fun, actually. Uh, people tend to enjoy it the most because there's a bit of scrambling. It's the only part on Kilimanjaro where you actually get to put your hands on the rocks a little bit because every, every other day is trekking, which means we're just walking and your hands are holding your poles. Here, we'll put our poles in our backpack and actually hold the rocks a little bit um, as we head to Karanga, which is another short day. Um, this is a picture of us actually on the Barranco Wall. So you could see it's like you could stand up straight. There's no need for ropes. Um, but it's a little bit of a steeper uh, uh, walk than what, we, what we're normally used to. But it's a lot of fun um, and great, great, a great opportunity to take photos. And this is Karanga Camp, which, is, uh, which we arrived to early. So we hopefully have a nice hot lunch there. And Karanga Camp is great because, as you can see, the views are spectacular. And this is only looking in one way um, at the mountain itself. And actually, you can, the summit is just tucked right behind uh, that little, uh, 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 what the, the little bit of snow at the top over there. You could see the M glacier to the left. It's a very famous glacier. And uh, and Noor, who's in this picture here, who was with us on one of our trips, she's actually looking at a spectacular view of the of the plains below and Mount Meru in the distance, which is the sister mountain to Kilimanjaro. Uh, the the our day five on the mountain is to Barafu. Uh, Barafu is summit base camp. So it's a very, very short day. Uh, we've, we've finished this day in about three hours. And the whole purpose behind it is for us to get to our summit base camp early so that we can rest and relax for as much as possible. Uh, because the following evening is where we go to summit. So we wanna have as much energy as we possibly can. So basically the drill is we get there around 11 a.m., have an early lunch, sleep for the afternoon, have an early dinner, sleep for as much of the night as possible, and then we're woken up at midnight to go to the summit. But I'll get to that in just a quick moment. I just want to show you some pictures from 
uh, heading up to Barafu. So you can see at this point, it's pure desert. There is nothing living up here. And it's just before we actually get to the glaciers, which are on the summit. Uh, very beautiful. Also, there's also a tiny bit of scrambling just before we get to uh, Barafu itself. And if you look at the glacier all the way at the top over there, those are the glaciers we'll be walking next to uh, just a few hours later when we, when we actually leave for the summit. And finally, you've got summit night, or, uh, which, is, which is the big, the big thing, I think, for, for most people. Everybody's always very interested in summit night. Um, summit night is a thing unto itself. So it's nothing new. It's nothing that we wouldn't have already done. It's just putting your foot one in front of the other. But it's a, it's a long experience, and it it's, takes you up into, into altitude. And different people experience it in different ways. Um, but like, like with all things Kilimanjaro, you know, it's about wanting it. That's what gets you through the summit night. It's about feeling like you want to do it. Um, if you do, then you'll see the point in why you're pushing yourself through it. And if you don't, then you won't see the point. So that's why I say that, generally speaking, the prerequisite for Kilimanjaro isn't how many burpees you can do. It's wanting it. If you want it, you can actually, you can, you can do it. Uh, but with summit night, the aim is to, we, we basically walk along the, uh, the route, which takes us to Stella Point, which, uh, it, which is at 5,600 meters. It's, uh, once you get to Stella Point, it's very gradual. And it, as we go around the crater and get to the high point, which is the Uhuru Peak. Uh, this is a picture of Stella Point. Um, and this was one of, a, one of the spectacular moments that, uh, you, uh, that, you, that, that you have in this place. It's like the sunrise is just something else, really, entirely. And I know that there are some people who do go to summit a little bit later. They start a little bit later in the morning. Um, but I feel like you really miss out on the whole point of Kilimanjaro, which is to get this view. And here's just another picture, just at Stella Point. So uh, we would have walked all the way up here from, from the camp. And what you can see in the distance is Mwenzi there. That's the second summit of Kilimanjaro. Of, uh, we're on Kibu, of course. And this is, a, this is a picture walking next to the glaciers with uh, the spectacular view of, of the lower mountain below us. And of course, this was, this was on our most recent climb this February. Um, it's past February where we had a bit of snow on the summit as well. Uh, but of course, the trail is very clear. So it's possible to walk without any technical gear and there's no chance of sliding. Um, and it's just really something that I, I can't even begin to describe. It's, you know, the, the pictures are beautiful, but when you're actually there, it's something entirely different. And finally, uh, and of course, that day we go down to Barafu again. So summit to Barafu, and then we continue down to Millennium. Uh, which is where we spend the night. Millennium is just on the edge of the short grass vegetation zone and the, and the desert, and it just gives us a chance to get a little bit lower where it's warmer and where there's, you know, where people tend to feel better and the rest over there is amazing. And then finally, day seven is uh, Millennium to Mueca. So it's back into the rainforest and just a straight shot to Mueca Gate. Usually we get there around two o'clock uh, in the afternoon. Uh, we do our checkout procedures. And then we head to, uh, and this is, uh, sorry, this is a picture as well from, uh, from Millennium Camp. And this is just before Moika Gate. You see, we go right back into uh, the, the amazing deep rainforest. And, uh, and then we do our checkout. And once we're done with checkout, what we do is we, um, we, have, uh, uh, we have an opportunity to stop for souvenirs on the way at these uh, cool souvenir shops. And then we have a dinner together, which is, of course, something that we do. We celebrate. Uh, there are certificates that go around. It's a lot of fun with all our guides as well. So everybody who, from our local team who are also with us as well, I think that's very important. Uh, and then uh, the, we spend the night in the hotel. And then the following day is us shuttling you back to, uh, to the airport. Or if you're going on safari or doing something else as well, then we'll get you in that vehicle and, and, and you'll be on your way. Uh, which is, of course, always the sad moment for me. Um, so that's basically the itinerary uh, in a nutshell. And I just wanted to uh, kind of go through that so that everybody can um, see uh, more or less what, what the, the whole thing looks like. And before I, I, hand, I jump into questions, um, I, I do want to just uh, say a couple of quick things. And I'm just going to end my video, uh, stop share here so that you guys can see me. All right, here we are. So um, 
Yes, so a, a couple of things about, uh, about this mountain. Um, Kilimanjaro, you know, one of the most common questions that I get is, I don't think I'm fit enough. I don't think, you know, friends of mine have been there and they told me that it's the most difficult thing they, they've ever done. And I don't think I can do it because they told me that they don't think I can do it. And I'd like to tell you that I've seen every walk of life on the summit of Kilimanjaro. I've seen people with a beer belly from their chin to the floor. I've seen amputees. I've seen people with disabilities of all sorts. I've seen people who on day one had told me 20 minutes into the rainforest, just leaving date, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. And I've seen them all at the top of the mountain and looking back and thinking to themselves, wow, I have that in me. Um, Kilimanjaro is a mind over matter game. If you sit at the base of the mountain and you look to the summit, it looks like, wow, how on earth am I going to do that? But when you break it down into baby steps, and that's what we do, you know, day one isn't about doing anything. It's about having a good night's rest at the hotel. Day two, we check in and then we do, you know, the small section of the walk until we stop for a break. And then we do the next section after that. And when you break it down like that, suddenly something that seems impossible actually becomes very possible and 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 for people who tend to look back you know say oh i did it but i don't think you can it's i call it graduation goggles it's like everybody you know whenever we do something that's amazing and challenging and really challenging whenever we tell that story we have a way of giving it a little a little oomph a little a, a, a little bit of creative hindsight um, something that was tough, but that I was able to do suddenly becomes impossible and insurmountable, but I did it. Um, and, and, and that's fine. So whenever you do hear these stories, I would always say, take it with a, with a pinch of salt, because, um, I think that from what I've seen, a lot of people have been able to, 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 to really make this something for themselves. And the, the experience that you have on Kilimanjaro is nothing short of transformative for me. This was one of the first, mount, first big mountains that I went to, one of the first high altitude mountains that I went to. And it had such a, a transformative experience on my life and my life choices. And that's why I feel so strongly about taking people to this particular place. Okay, that's enough for me. I'm going to actually uh, turn to your questions now. Um, and I see here, a, uh, I'm just going to read it quickly and then uh, paraphr uh, paraphrase it. Right. So um, this, is, this is actually a very common question. It's about a fear of heights and, and, and people feeling like, uh, uh, you know, that's something that they, that they feel they can't overcome. So on Kilimanjaro, as you can see in the pictures, at no point are we actually on any kind of edge or ledge or, or anything where you feel like you're exposed. Uh, of course, if you look far out into the distance, so if I'm sitting on Kilimanjaro and I'm looking way out away from me, I'll see that there is distance between me and and the and the the, the you know the plains of the Serengeti, uh, five thousand meters of you know five kilometers of distance. Um, but uh, but you never feel at at no point does the trail put you in a position where you are actually. Uh, feel physically exposed to some kind of, uh, uh, you know, cliffside or, uh, or, or, or anything that'll give you that fear of heights. That's it, it. The trail is always, you know, there's a lot of space on your left hand side to wiggle through. There's always space on your right hand side to move to. So I don't think that that's, uh, that's something that, uh, that you'll really face, but it is a common question. The only place where that might be an issue is um, uh, the only place where that might be an issue is um, uh, on the Barranco wall. Uh, and even then, I've had somebody who suffers from vertigo, serious vertigo. So it isn't the, it's, it's not a fear of heights. It's a, if he, see, if he stands on a balcony, uh, his, his blood pressure drops and he has to hold on to something. And, you know, that's, uh, and, and, and he managed okay, actually actually very well on the Barranco wall because at no point do you feel like, whoa, if I fall, I'm going to tumble. No, it's, there's like big space, there are big ledges, but there's lots of people around who are, you know, or who can hold your hand and just pull you through that little bit. And that's only a one hour stretch of a seven day trip. And it really isn't something to worry about. Actually, that the same person that I'm describing, 
uh, now in hindsight, thinks of that as having been the most exciting part of, of the trip for him because it also challenged him a little bit. And, 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 and he felt like that was something that he was able to overcome. Um, and Kilimanjaro does that. It, sh it throws those little challenges at you and makes you um, overcome them. And that's, that's one of the great things that you have in an experience like this. Um, so I've got a, a, a question about um, how many people per group. So we limit uh, all of our trips. Uh, the maximum number that we'll take is 12. Um, sometimes there might be a one extra. Uh, and that's usually if like, if, if, you know, if we're full and somebody who's significant other wants to join or something like that, then in that case, we might make an exception. But uh, we try to cap our group at, tw at, at uh, size at 12. And the reason why we do that is uh, because this is, Kilimanjaro is a personal experience. It really is. Uh, it's not a wholesale experience. Um, and, and, and part of that experience is to be part of a, of, of a team, a cohesive team. You'll find that when we talk about Kilimanjaro, we rarely talk about summits. We rarely talking, you know, we don't, we're not interested in people kind of elbowing each other and to, to, to be at the front or anything like that. Actually, by the, by the first dinner, you'll see that we become family um, and that family stays. Uh, I still have, you know, my WhatsApp groups from three years ago are still pinging on birthdays and, and, uh, and, and, you know, anniversaries of summits. And just yesterday, we had a, a summit anniversary from a team of, from 2018, um, June 2018, when we did the Moranga route. So uh, it's, it's very important that this experience is personal, that you get the personal attention from me and from the rest of the team. Um, and also at the same time, so that we stay together as one cohesive unit. I, I, I don't think it's a nice thing when kind of, it becomes too big and it breaks up into sub teams and then you have kind of stronger climbers moving together weaker climbers move no I, I don't like that i like everybody to be together and summit uh together and be part of one cohesive team and i think 12 is the right number for that um the oh so really interesting question about uh, uh mountain sickness and altitude right uh and this is going to give me an opportunity to talk about a couple of uh, interesting things. So I'm just going to uh, quickly um, uh, explain what altitude sickness is or mountain sickness is uh, for those of us who don't know. So mountain sickness is when, uh, so basically as we go up into altitude, there's less pressure. Um, as, uh, as there's less pressure, um, uh, as there, because there's less pressure, there's less oxygen in the atmosphere uh, 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 Right, so there's less oxygen in the atmosphere uh, when, we, when we inhale. So although we're inhaling the same amount of air in our lungs, the, the density of oxygen in that air is less because the pressure of the, of the atmosphere is less. All this to say, we're taking in less oxygen. The result of that uh, is that sometimes uh, when we reach certain altitudes, uh, some of us can experience something called mountain sickness, which, which is our body negatively reacting to the less oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, and the way that we deal with that is by acclimatization. And I spoke a little bit about that at the beginning, why I like the Machami route, because it's great for acclimatization. It, it, what, what acclimatization is, is it's basically giving our body a chance to adapt. And the way that we do that is we expose our body to a bit of altitude, and then we relieve it a little bit. And then we expose it to a little bit more of altitude, and then we relieve it a little bit. And, uh, and that's what this route does. You know, we start at 3,000, then we go to 3,8, we sleep at 3,7. Then we go to 4,5 and 4,500 meters, then we sleep at 3,700 meters. So we're, we're constantly doing this. The other thing that we do to ensure, to, to reduce the exposure to altitude sickness is to uh, walk extremely slowly, eat very well. This is actually one of the few experiences in the world where you can eat four, 5,000 calories a day and still lose weight because your body, what it's doing to adapt to acclimatization, what it's, is it's producing more red blood cells. And in order to produce red blood cells, it's burning calories. So in addition to the calories we're burning from walking, your body at rest is also burning calories from, uh, from actually producing more red blood cells to carry this less oxygen more efficiently to the different parts of your body. So eating very well is very important. Staying well hydrated and drinking very well is very important. Um, but we've never ever encountered, you know, getting a little bit ill some, you know, for a couple of hours on one day is normal. 
um, you know, feeling a little lightheaded. This is normal. Uh, when we talk about mountain sickness, we're talking about serious mountain sickness where, where it can be life-threatening. And that doesn't really happen uh, on this trail when it's done properly. Of course, if somebody wants to run a marathon from, you know, sprint it from, from the gate to the top in two days, that's a different thing. What I mean is following this itinerary, seven days, walking at a good pace, eating well, drinking well, we never ha we've never actually faced a problem with, uh, with altitude sickness. Um, so that's, uh, that's that question. I hope I answered it. Of course, if there, there's always, there are always more interesting things that people are going to ask me about mountain sickness and I'm happy to address them, but I'm just going to move on to the next question. And then I'm sure I'll come back to it because somebody will definitely be asking me about Diamox. I'm sure of that. Um, there is no age restriction. Somebody just asked me about age restrictions. Um, and there, uh, so there is no, uh, I've taken, with Life Happens Outdoors, we've, uh, the youngest that we've ever taken on Kilimanjaro is 13 years old. Uh, of course, if you're below the age of 18, you have to be accompanied by a parent or a signed guardian. So basically, we, uh, so if you're coming with your brother or your sister, uh, you will have to have a letter from the, the legal authority of that person, so a parent or, or a legal guardian that authorizes you to, bring, to, 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 to take uh, decisions on their behalf and to bring them to this trip. Uh, but outside of that, uh, we don't have a lower, uh, there is no actual age restriction on Kilimanjaro, uh, that a legal age restriction. Um, then uh, I've got a question about some gear. Uh, so somebody's asking me if the uh, decathlon is good quality. Um, uh, so that's the, I'll answer that. There are a couple of parts to this question, so I'll answer that first. Uh, decathlon is great. Um, I, I personally use a lot of decathlon products. Uh, my shorts are decathlon. My, my t-shirts are decathlon. Um, I, the, one of the down jackets that I used for a really long time was decathlon. The only place where I would say, okay, you might want to invest a little bit more than uh, decathlon is maybe in a good sleeping bag. Uh, it, it should be negative 10 as comfort. And we'll, be, we'll send out some more information about exactly what you need to look for for different bits of gear. But um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's what's really important. Should be little or even a little bit more than minus 10 if that's possible, um, if that's available to you. Um, but otherwise, the Cathlon products are great and you should be able to find 99% of what's on the gear list for Kilimanjaro there. Um, I have another question about being a vegetarian. Uh, yes, that's no issue. Uh, vegetarian, like you could be a vegetarian and climb Kilimanjaro, of course. Um, and, and actually carbs are your friend on Kili. So think, uh, lots of potatoes, lots of pasta, lots of stews, lots of things like that. Uh, that's, that's what we're going to be serving. Of course, for those of us who are, uh, meat eaters, uh, we have meat on the menu as well. So don't worry about that. But if you're a vegetarian, we can totally accommodate and that's never been an issue for anybody. Um, it's absolutely eating meat is not strictly necessary at all. And we've had, we've had a vegan on the summit of Kili. So there is no, there's no issue with that. Um, then there's another question here about, uh, weight. Uh, what's the weight that we're going to be carrying, uh, during the trip? And that's a great question. Um, so for, for, uh, uh on your, your backpack should not weigh more than four kilos and that's with water. Uh, it's, so it's always a very lightweight backpack. There's, uh, it's, it's very, uh, actually throughout the entire way that we run Kilimanjaro, uh, there is never a need for a packed lunch. So we'll always reach a place where we're going to sit and have a hot lunch. So you don't even need to carry your lunch. The only thing that you need to have in your backpack on a daily basis is your water, the layers for that day, which are usually not very many more than what you're already wearing. So it'll be like an extra, an extra, um, uh, a down jacket or maybe a fleece for the, the warmer days and, and maybe a, uh, a waterproof jacket if, it, if we fear that it's going to rain. Um, and don't worry, uh, we'll send you out. Like if you, if you don't know what fleece and uh, you know, all of that is, uh, don't worry at all about that. We'll, we'll let you know. Uh, we'll, we'll send you a jargon buster so that you can understand what the different, uh, what the different things are. Um, right. Uh, so, so, uh, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's an answer to, to, so your, your, your backpack will only have literally your, your, your layers, your water and your snacks for the day. And again, this is another thing that a lot of people, especially from like certain different parts, like different parts of the world, we have these ideas of, Oh, if I'm going to have a snack for me, I have to have, a, you know, snacks for everybody. And you end up putting five kilos of dates in your backpack. 
uh, yeah, we don't do that. Um, everybody should have exactly what they need. Otherwise, you're going to end up carrying a lot of weight for other people. Um, and we, we do a bag check uh, to make sure that the weight is, is correct. Um, and then you also have your duffel bag. Uh, the duffel bag is what goes with the porters. Uh, so that's our team. Uh, we take care of that. Um, your duffel bag is usually between, it should be around 12 kilos, not, not heavier. Um, and that's where we put your sleeping bag, your other layers that you're not wearing for the day, your, you know, extra camera batteries, your whatever it is that, um, that you don't need strictly for that stretch of that day. And you'll have access to your duffel bag at every camp. So whenever we arrive at a camp, your duffel bag will be in your tent already when you get there. Um, and then when we're about to leave camp, you can unpack your, uh, your bag will be there as well. You just pack it up, close it up and then it'll meet you at the next camp, usually it gets there before you, actually, which is just how powerful uh, some of the guys who, uh, who, who you meet on that trail actually are. It's, it's, it's quite spectacular. Um, great, so I'm going to uh, address one other question um, that I feel is uh, pretty important, and that's the question of medication and diamox. And I will, uh, I, I see your question, Maroon, and I will get to it in a moment. Um, but, or maybe I'll just get to that, uh, first. Actually, yeah, let me just address that first. So, um, the, the lowest possible temperature that we could face on Kilimanjaro is during summit night. Uh, it can dip to as low as negative 15 degrees Celsius, which is quite cold. Um, and the coldest portion of the entire trip is actually the first hour to hour and a half when we leave the camp, because we're, you know, we're, uh, usually what happens is every, we're wearing everything because we just, we just started to move and, um, and, and, it, and it's already quite cold uh, where we are. And, uh, and as we start to walk up the mountain, our bodies naturally start to get warm because we're active. And so we start to delayer. And usually what tends to happen is that uh, the, all the heavy layers are worn at the very beginning. And then by the time we get to summit, actually you see that a lot of people have taken most of their layers off. Of course, there are exceptions and I've lived through them where we've had some difficult weather at the top where it necessitated that we keep those layers on, but we've never been under layered. Um, but it, temperatures vary dramatically. So uh, most days on Kilimanjaro, it can reach up to 20 degrees Celsius, even higher uh, if there's no wind. Um, and, uh, and at night it'll dip to somewhere in the range of zero. Uh, once we're in our sleeping bags, it can be quite comfortable. So, uh, don't worry about that. Um, and then, uh, with the exception of summit night, summit, summit night is the only night where we will be actively moving in the cold. Um, usually on all previous days, we're actively moving when it's, uh, when it's warmer. Um, right, so I'm just going to uh, quickly address uh, this, the Diamox question. Uh, so for those of you who haven't heard of Diamox, good. <laughs> um, so Diamox is a medication. Um, it's actually apocetazolamine. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a treatment that was originally used and still is used for myopia. Uh, but it's proven effective at reducing the symptoms of, of, uh, of altitude. And so a lot of uh, forums and, it's, and, and, uh, and, and climbing outfits and trekking outfits, especially locally, but also anywhere in the world. So if you go to Nepal or you go to Tanzania or you go to anywhere, most places, uh, the, uh, you'll find that Diamox is this conversation that keeps coming up. Um, so Diamox, uh, first thing that everybody needs to be aware of is that Diamox does not treat altitude sickness. Diamox masks the symptoms of altitude sickness. So it'll make your headache go away a little bit. Uh, you know, if you have one, it'll, it'll give you that little bit of an energy boost, but it doesn't mean that your body is acclimatizing better. Uh, so with Life Happens Outdoors, on our trips from the very beginning, we have strictly prohibited the taking of Diamox uh, unless it's uh, administered by one of our guides and in a situation in which we would need you to take that medication so that we can safely take you down. Taking Diamox in order to summit the mountain is extremely unsafe because it means that we as team leaders are unable to actually know if you are acclimatizing well, which is why you're looking great, you're feeling great, you're not complaining, you're eating great, or 
if Diamox is just masking the symptoms until you're in a state that is beyond what we can treat. And that's the, that's the fundamental problem with, with, with taking this medication. So a lot of, uh, and, and, and actually in the mountaineering circles, so for those of us who, who, who go up to high altitude quite often and are, are, uh, are in this community, Diamox has become a, a big faux pas. Uh, and mostly it's just people who coming up to this place for the first time and you know, using an operator who just wants to keep a summit record uh, and uh, quite high and tell people, oh, you know, 10 out of 10 summit Kilimanjaro with me. Um, they're the ones who recommend a Diamox. Diamox has, there's another problem with it, and uh, I don't want to dwell too much on this, but Diamox is a diuretic. And actually the biggest problem on Kilimanjaro uh, that we face is not altitude sickness. Most people think that mountain sickness, altitude sickness is the issue on Kili, and it isn't. It's actually dehydration. Uh, people are feeling cold, and so they feel like they drink a little bit less, but we're still on the equator, so the sun is out, and that sun is hitting you and you're drinking a little bit less, maybe you're not taking your, you're not taking your electrolytes, and, uh, and, and so you feel like, you know, you're, as, as we normally do, you know, if, if anybody who's been out in the cold, you drink less water than you do when, you're, when it's hot and, and you're sweating. So, uh, and then of course, that kind of starts to spiral and people start to feel a little bit ill and they think it's altitude sickness, so they pop a pill of Diamox, it makes it worse because it's a diuretic and you're, while, you're, while your body is telling you it needs to keep the water in, you pop a pill that forces the water out and you can see how this thing starts to spiral. So um, this is just uh, one, of those, one of those things and it's a question I feel needs uh, to be answered right at the very beginning. Um, is there, are there any other questions that uh, anybody, you know, there's no stupid question. Uh, you can feel free to just uh, pop me with, uh, or, or ping me directly if you like, um, with, uh, with any questions that you might have. And before I wrap up, uh, I just wanted to let everybody know um, that we have right now at Life Happens Outdoors, uh, we know that COVID-19 is an issue. Uh, for a lot of people. And that's why we are actually uh, looking forward to 2021. And we're actually not uh, uh, thinking too much about the nearer term because of, uh, because of the situation. And so we understand that traveling is an issue. Um, so what we've done to make it a little bit easier for everybody is, first of all, we've dropped our, usually the booking deposits for these trips are 20% uh, are, uh, of the trip cost. Uh, we've reduced that down to, we've capped it at 100 euros. So that's the, that's the cost of, uh, of booking your place. And there's nothing else due until eight weeks before the trip. We've also, uh, and that's, and that's, uh, that's uh, available to you up until the 1st of July. So if you book anything now, it only costs 100 euros. Um, we've also uh, changed our, book, our deposit uh, rules so that uh, deposits are now transferable. So if you can't actually, if you're worried about not making the trip, uh, you're able to actually transfer your deposit, which previously was not transferable, uh, to any other trip up to 30 days before uh, the departure of the trip. So little things to make things a little bit easier. And plus, you guys are all going to get a 200 euro discount, which is uh, valid until the 1st of September. So hopefully, you'll make use of that. Um, there is a question over here, which is, uh, are there any specific kinds of walking poles you recommend? Um, look, for Kilimanjaro, um, you don't need to be too, like you don't need anything too fancy. Uh, just any kind of retractable trekking pole uh, that you find at Decathlon is perfectly fine. Um, if you were looking for a brand recommendation for something that's like, super you know you're, you're worried about like the weights and, and things like that and you want something that's foldable and goes into your backpack so that, that you don't feel like you're hitting sitting you on the back of the head um there's lakey which is uh, spelled l-e-k-i um which is a great swiss brand i don't know uh if it's possible to find everywhere but that's what i would go for uh or a decath um a black diamond also have a great one um which is a foldable not retractable so instead of it going into itself it actually, you like you, it folds and then you, you just can stuff it in your backpack. And I personally like those. But like I said, for Kilimanjaro, you don't need to go all out and get crazy, spectacular technical gear uh, because it, it, it can actually push the budget and it's not necessary. Uh, any good pair of trekking poles from Decathlon will work. Any good pair of, of trekking boots that'll keep your feet warm and the water out, that's great. Uh, you know, any good uh, down jacket or waterproof jacket is fine. You don't need to go and look for the latest, greatest uh, 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 brand. 
uh, for that. Sorry, I kind of went a little bit long on that. Uh, does anybody have any other questions before we wrap this up? Um, well, okay, great. So um, from, from my end, uh, I just, you know, thank you guys so much for, um, for, for staying with us and uh, for participating in this. Uh, we hope to be doing more of these for different trips as well. So uh, you guys can get to know us a little bit more. We can get to know you a little bit more. Um, and you'll know uh, who you're going with, which I think is super important. Um, look, uh, Kilimanjaro is one of those places that you just have to, you know, you just go, right? You, uh, you overthinking it and over planning it tends to become a little bit of a thing, and then it it never really happens. So, um, if you can if you can walk, uh, and you 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 want it, you want to do something that can change your life and and change the way you are. Uh, this is one of those experiences. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I used to weigh 110 kilos and I was a chain smoker. Um, this mountain changed my life. It was a big part of that. And, uh, and, and I've seen it change the lives of so many people um, who've, been, who've been to this place. And I think that's one of the attractions for me is that I get to see how uh, different people come to this place and experience it in their own ways. And I can't say that anybody has ever left this place, summit or no summit, without having this incredible transformative thing happen in their lives that then they take back into their normal lives. So uh, this is definitely uh, something that I would, you know, and, and, I'm, and I'm there as well. I mean, I wouldn't put myself through it <laughs> if it was just, you know, grueling. It isn't, it's, it's something that's really special. Uh, on that note, we'll be sending you guys all out uh, an email with the promo code uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for Kilimanjaro. If you have any questions after this is done, please don't hesitate to, to drop us an email at any time. I'm always very happy to, to, to answer that and we'll make this video available to you by email as well so you can watch it or share it with your friends or, or whatever. And um, oh, there's one more question here. Okay, I will, I'll tackle that. Uh, can a person with knee problems but can walk make it to the summit? Uh, we'll have to, it depends what. I mean, the, 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 the answer, the, the fast answer is yes, uh, but we'll have to talk about what that knee problem is uh, and go into detail um, uh, and, and, and understand where, where the issue is. Because uh, for some people who have um, general uh, knee problems, so like, you know, they just have a, they get pain when they run, for instance, um, sometimes that's actually an LT band issue. Uh, and not an e, a knee issue, but if you have something like a, like a, a torn meniscus or uh, you've had surgery on your knee, um, that's going to be something that we'll have to talk about. It doesn't mean that you can't do it. Uh, like I said, I've seen amputees on the summit of Kilimanjaro, but it just means that we'll have to uh, discuss what's the best way uh, for you to be able to do it and what you might need to do beforehand to get yourself comfortable before we actually go for it. Um, so that'll be something that maybe you can uh, drop an, uh, a, an email uh, to us with uh, just a little bit more detail of what your condition is and we'll be very happy to kind of look into that. And we've, we've gone, you know, we, and we do this all the time. So we've had people who come to us with specific questions about heart issues, specific questions about, uh, about different, uh, different uh, kind of uh, physiological problems. Uh, and there's always... I don't think there's ever been a situation that we, have, if not if not right now, at least we've been able to solve it over uh, over some time and make it possible for you. So definitely uh, don't take that as being a no. Take that as being a absolutely. But I, we just need some more details to make it possible. And I got one other question, uh, and I think I'll take this will be the last one because I don't want to keep you guys too long. It's already been 50 minutes. Um, the question is, uh, will Vida join? <laughs> Uh, my sis is a big fan of hers. Uh, Ida is my fiance and co-founder of Life Happens Outdoors, and she's on 99.9% .9 of trips. I say that 99.9 .9 because there have been a, maybe one or two that she hasn't been on, uh, actually Kilimanjaro being one of them. Uh, so what, I'll tell you what, if you're, you know, when you, when you choose which trip you're going to join, uh, I will ensure that Ida is on that trip. All right. <laughs> and we'll make it we'll make it possible. 
Uh, great, guys. Uh, if there's no other question, um, then I think we will wrap this up now. And again, a big thanks to everybody. Uh, you guys are going to get an email from us with all the details. And thank you so much for, for, uh, for being here. And, uh, and yeah, see you soon.